Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is Anne Cameron, and I'm a, I work as a curator in the Moving Image and Sound collections at the National Library of Scotland. I'm usually based at Kelvin Hall, but today I'm still stuck in Paisley working from home. But I'm very pleased to meet all of you today online. Today, so I've been told, is National Go Fishing Day. And what better way to spend it than a bit of time virtually diving into the film vaults with me? It's been over a year since I started contributing to the National Library's online events programme. And though we can't be together at the Kelvin Hall today with the lights down low for a big screen experience, I'm excited that this environment allows us to, allows many of you to join from wherever you are in the world. I want you to feel the crash of the waves and the taste of the salt in the air. There'll also be time for some questions at the end of the session, so please do get thinking and just type your questions in to the Q&A function in Zoom and we'll do our best to get as many, do as many as we can. So without further ado, I'm going to start my presentation and take you on a fishing trip. <clears throat> so for those of you unfamiliar with the Library's Moving Image and Sound collections, We've been around since 1976, and that was when the Scottish Film Archive began. And our mission really is the same today as it always has been. We want to find, preserve and provide access to Scotland's moving image heritage, no matter what the format. We're now based in the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow. We opened there in 2016 as part of the National Library's digital collections. And the Moving Image Archive is also based there. We preserve film from as far back as the 1890s, the very, uh, the very advent of film itself, and some of which luckily I've got to show you today. We've also got contemporary collecting right up to the coronavirus lockdown of recent uh, months. So our collection spans that whole range of, of decades and time periods. Whether moving image comes, in, comes to us in boxes or reels, or it's transferred digi digitally at the touch of a button, it's really what you see that's invaluable. So a little bit of an introduction to the moving image formats that we collect. Some of you may recognise some of these. We've got all sorts of film reels of different shapes and sizes from nitrate film right through to small gauge 8 mil and 9.5. We've also got lots of videotape, so one inch professional uh, tape that was used in television broadcasts, um, right up to camcorder formats of various descriptions and digital. So there's everything and everything you can possibly think of and there's still things coming in that we have to scratch our heads such as laser disc. So there's all sorts of things in the collection. <clears throat> you may, we do have professional and home, home um, formats so that's that's something to keep in mind as well. We reckon there are well over 46,000 items in the collection and that's growing exponentially all the time. So it's quite a job just to keep up with it all. One small note for interest sake, um, the moving image collection is not subject to the same legal deposit regulations as quite a lot of the library, the National Library of Scotland is. So we do select material according to the collection policy, much like the archive uh, world, the moving image archive world does that purely because we can't possibly afford to keep everything and we do sample some things like home movies. A very quick look at some of the genres and types of films in the archive. Um, we have everything, a lot of our collection is non-fiction but there is also a lot of um, fiction material and performance archive coming in as well now, creative works. We have things like local topicals which are local films that would have been made to show in the local cinema, such as a good example of that is the Bonus Children's Fair Festival films that we have. We've got a run of them dating from 1912 to the present day. Uh, maybe not to the present day, but very recently. Um, we have newsreel footage, documentary footage. We have huge collections of quite important works um, in the documentary collection, such as Oscar Marzaroli, Bill Versailles, John Grierson. So it is quite a good collection of documentary footage. Uh, we have educational films, promotional films, everything. Um, cine magazines such as the Babcock and Wilcox 
Works magazine that would have gone out to workers in, in the company across the UK. Um, and we're very strong in an amateur filmmaking tradition in Scotland. Um, we have the records of the Scottish Amateur Film Festival, for example, and lots of educational films come out of that as well. Um, we're also very privileged to hold the records that survive of the Scottish regional television production. So things like Scottish television and Grampian television, uh, the BBC Scotland hold their own archive, but we do have some material available to view on site. Um, we also hold Gaelic language material from the advent of broadcast in that language in 1993. So it's I don't have time to go into any detail today, but it's just to give you a context of the collection of where we, we sit within the library. So down to fishing films, which is why we're here today. Um, audiovisual collections offer an amazingly rich source of, of information about Scotland's fishing heritage, from the boats, nets and clothing that were used to recording the everyday hustle and bustle of the harbours that landed the catch. I've tried to include a range of material in today's showreel, but of course there's more that can't be included due to time and copyright. For example, a really early film we have is called Tirona and a Whaler. It came to the archive via the British Film Institute, the Bundes Archive in Berlin, and also the Imperial War Museum. And it was originally shot in 35mm nitrate film. It depicts the whaling station in Harris and a whaling boat and crew going out to the remote island of Rona. So these are the sorts of records that we prize in the collection, early records as well as more modern material. Uh, but there are difficulties with dating films, sometimes silent films are unclear and we don't always have a definite date. So if there's anything that you can see in the films today that you feel is an error or that you would like to comment on, please do. We also have some unusual things like um, a Scottish ballet production called Souls of Herring, which was recorded in 1993, and we preserve that on videotape um, and we've digitised that for preservation now. So there's a real range of material connected with the sea in the collection. Today's talk, though, aims to offer a mere taster of the sorts of films preserved by the National Library. I've put, through a, I've put together an edited showreel with the help of my technical colleague, colleague Stuart that allows the films to speak for themselves. Silent films have no added soundtrack, although I may talk over them just to give you a little bit of context. Sound films are presented with their original tracks intact and I think that's quite important. I like to present things as they actually are and in context. There might be some scratching visible, there might be sound fluctuation, but that's reflective of the archive. It's what people actually recorded and the equipment that they had. So not everyone had professionally um, professional standard equipment, for example. The selected extracts run chronologically, starting with the recently restored Kenora Reels footage, and that's from the 1890s, uh, right through to the fishing communities of Aberdeen in 1963. There are excerpts from all sorts of different kinds of films and I'll try and talk you through what I can. And I'd also like to highlight that I've created a handout and that will be distributed to you after the talk with a few more links. One thing I would say from revisiting some of the films in the collection from a personal viewpoint, these records are powerful and emotive, living, breathing documents as well as historical records. My personal view is that art can and does imitate life, so you can accept these films in different ways according to what you want to see. You can definitely see Norman McCaig's Lights of the Fishing Fleet, Fireflies in the Green Fields of the Sea in our collection. John Grierson, the pioneering Scottish filmmaker, defined documentaries as the creative treatment of actuality, and I think that's a brilliant description. It can be both real and unreal. And I love this quote from his film Drifters, which was one of the first documentaries he produced. Um, and it's about the herring industry in Scotland. So I'll leave you with the opening intertitle of that, just to give you some food for thought before commencing the showreel. The herring fishing has changed. Its story was once an idyll of brown sails and village harbours. Its story is now an epic of steam and steel. So without further ado, I'm going to press the play button and 
I hope that you enjoy the showreel today. So the first few films that I have for you today, um, these are the Wick Kenora reels. And the Kenora reel was quite an early form of, of moving image. It was produced on a kind of flick book, that's what I'd describe it as. And each card was restored at the archive and digitally restored and put together, um, stitched together digitally. And you can see this is the fishermen reading their nets in Wick Harbour. They're hauling the the nets over to remove any stray fish and this was a daily task and it's quite hard work as you can see. The fishermen are chatting with their gansy, their knitted, their knitted jumpers on and this is footage of boats coming into the Wick Harbour. Um, this is a summer herring season and the boats we've identified in this sequence are actually from Lewis and Lossiemouth. So Wick was a real hub of activity for this, for herring fishing at this time. You can see the movement isn't quite right, but that's reflective of the flick book, sort of Kenora reel movement anyway. But it, it's a kind of, it takes you back in time because of that, I think. And here we have the wet harbour itself, uh, the hustle and bustle of the, the fishing. And you can see the wee boy at the front, he's, he's enchanted by the camera, he's not moving. And I think a film camera would have been a very unusual thing at that time. This is a steam paddle tug that was used to tow the sail powered fishing boats out into the harbour to catch the wind. So it's really old footage of old methods. And the final little sequence, these reels are only about half a minute long each. This is uh, the storm, uh, storm at Wick Harbour and you can see it's quite violent. And the, the people that watched these reels, it was almost an entertainment for them. This was a commercially produced reel. So to us, it's very rare, but at the time, this would have been something you bought and you could watch in the comfort of your home if you had a viewer. So that's a little snapshot of Wick, a way back in time. And now we're moving on to Montrose Harbour and the lifeboats, the lifeboat there. This film was actually filmed in 35mm film, film um, Nitrate, and it was really a fundraiser. So one of the titles in the film says the RNLI requires 3,000 well, £3, a year. What's that? <laughs> £3,000 a year. Um, so this, this was a way of showing the, the hard work and the determination that these men had and the size of the boat and the the mast you can see is tucked in for launch and you also get a sense of what the seafaring men would wear in those days so there's the oil skins and the cork life jackets. coast of Scotland, where the North Sea and the swirling rivers are forever meeting, crashing against the stubborn rocks or caressing the desolate shores with silver ripples. And in this lonely corner of the world live the Scottish fisher folk, their cottages clustering around the protecting cliffs. the salmon fishers, toiling as did their forefathers, industrious, simple folk with the strength of giants. Down to the sea these sturdy fighters go, to wrest a living from the reluctant deep. The first job is to wheel their heavy boat over the shore, 
with the aid of this old runner. wheels taking the weight of the craft as the men pull down the pole. For centuries the runner has been employed for this purpose. We asked them why they didn't have something more modern. They said why should they have a newfangled contraption when this simple old affair did the job perfectly and didn't cost anything. Trust these hard bitten stuffmen when it comes to economics. is returned to its parking place. Then the work of the day begins. This being a Saturday morning, they're preparing to take up the last falls of salmon for the week. For tomorrow will be a day of rest. Away they go to the first line of nets. But what's this fellow doing? And why this strange looking network? He's also after salmon, but depends on fly nets, staked near the shore. A primitive but successful method of fishing. And this is another example of a silent film. This is a film called Stornoway, 1939. But this isn't actually Stornoway, this is Musselboro. Um, and it was filmed in 1939 in beautiful early colour stock. And you can see basically the fishing fleet and the families leaving the Fisher Owen Musselboro Bend for the herring, herring fishing, the herring grounds in the West Coast. <laughs> so you can see everyone's happy and they're all excited about this big event in the in the town. And what you get from these amateur films is a real sense of community and a sense of um, occasion. And I think there's no agenda particularly in these films. They're just a record of what was happening. Um, this film was actually part of a compilation reel, which we would preserve as the whole thing. So there was a mix of black and white and colour footage on it. Um, but we can pick out sections like this and try and do some research on them. So it can be quite a time consuming process, but I think it's very worthwhile. And we do try and gather as much data as possible from the donors as well. You can see they're all waving people off and they're all very happy. <laughs> the filmmaker was Alec Lowe, who was a figure in the town, um, I believe, the family was involved in market gardens and also politics in the town. So some of you may know more than I do about this, this part of the world. And this footage has been used in various productions and presentations and sound has been added and we would always acknowledge that in the record if that was the case but I quite like looking at it in the original. This is another amateur film. The term amateur can be interpreted as possibly not as good as professional, but I don't believe that's true. I think this is a very informative film. It's got quite a lot of facts and figures in it, but it's done in a very 
personal way. And that's what I like about these films. This was made by um, J. Evans Gordon, who was in a, who took a house in Lossiemouth and he filmed this while he was up there. And you can see there's a announcement of the fish prices at the start of the film. So there's a bit of social history right there. But it's done in a kind of fun way. He's created his own titles and his own maps. So these films are very, they're a labour of love, that's what I call them. But they're also quite informative. I mean, I go up there on holiday quite regularly and to see the harbour teeming with life is quite something. I don't think you get that same sense of it from a pure um, photograph. So the, it really just records the activities around the harbour and the importance of fishing is quite evident in this film. You can see the amount of fish getting landed. It's quite an important um, economic centre for fishing. <clears throat> this film was actually shown in the public hall in Lossiemouth, we believe, uh, but we believe there was sound on it at that time, so I'm still curious. We're still trying to find out where the sound is because we don't believe we have it. So it'd be interesting to know if Mr Gordon just added his own track. <laughs> There's a huge fish coming ash ashore there. <clears throat> This is Mr Gordon's nephew, so he's got a walk-on role. And you often find that in amateur footage, the people use their families and friends as characters in the film, so I think that's quite a nice touch. It's interesting the use of language there, 250 other persons, and you wonder if they, the women Every were involved in this at all. Put out <clears> from <throat> Lerwick, Stornoway and Wick, from Fraserborough, Peterhead and Eyemouth, from Berwick, North Shields and Scarborough, and down to Yarmouth and Lowestoft, where the chase ends in the autumn. There was little money in herring fishing between the two wars, so many of the boats are old. Very few steam drifters have been built to replace those worn out. But new diesel engine boats are now being built for the fleet with government assistance by grants and loans to fishermen. Naval craft, in which the fishermen may have served, have also been adapted for fishing. The fishermen need a lot of gear. Nets, for instance, cost about 18 pounds, compared with about three or four pounds pre-war. And a drifter may shoot 70 at a time, over a thousand pounds worth. The crew must own two or three times as many to allow for losses. Salt, boxes and barrels for packing the catch. All these things have to be provided before the fleet puts out to sea. More than a hundred boats put out in an afternoon from this Scottish port, nosing their way past the Golden Horde. This is a wee snippet from an amateur film again from it was actually an amateur prize-winning film at the Scottish Amateur Film Festival and the Scottish Association of Amateur Cinematographers. And it was made by a well-known amateur in the collection called Ian Dunnachy. Um, and I like these. These are a sort of counterpoint to those big professionally produced or sponsored documentaries. This is just a record of a crofter carrying out his, his work on the West Coast.
this little extract is from an educational film. Um, and what you do find that these films are really informative and um, they capture a place and time. This is our both, um, Home of the Smoky. <clears throat> and it was made by the Dundee group of the Scottish Amateur Film Association. He's weighing out the, the Smokies for the ladies. There's not many men buying them, put it that way. <laughs> and also um, we do have teaching notes. So it's not only the films we preserve, we often have accompanying documentation that, that helps research the films. Unfortunately, I can't access that at the moment at Kelvin Hall, but um, probably would like to look into that a wee bit more and I could possibly glean some more information about that. Come with me and look a little closer into Sutherland. From the Ross Sher Hills at Struy, Sutherland lies before you. The Kyle of Sutherland lies down there to the west. A Kyle is a narrow strip of water and up at Bonner Bridge the Kyle is really narrow. The main road into Sutherland crosses here. Practically all the traffic for Sutherland and Caithness goes across this bridge. Many who pass over it stop to watch the salmon fishers. Here in the Kyle of Sutherland there are several salmon stations where men fish not for sport but for their daily brain. Not for them the thrill of a screaming line but the hard graft of a laden net being pulled against a fast flowing tide. And when the net is in there is always the boat to be pulled back for the start of another run. A full net here in the Kyle is a rich harvest for the fish are fresh in from the sea and in fine condition for the market. But sometimes, after all that work, there isn't a fish in the net, or perhaps just one. Not enough. 
a plant needs more than local fishermen can provide. So frequently, lorry loads of crabs are brought from the west coast of Scotland. These crabs are caught by men like John MacDonald. He is a crofter fisherman who sometimes works on the land and sometimes is out on the gearlock at his creels. Today, he's out to collect his week's catch, which he has stored in boxes close in shore. And while he is busy there, Ian MacDonald, a full-time fisherman who spends all his days catching crabs, is nearing Gearlock Pier, bringing his week's catch to the waiting lorry. Gearlock Pier is a busy place when the lorry comes to collect the crabs. Sometimes the fisherman gets a welcome from the holidaymaker. This is a wee snippet from a big collection by Templar Films and it was actually a negative, a black and white negative with no sound. And we think it may have been stock footage made for a bigger programme, we don't know. But it shows um, Lerwick and the fishing industry up there. But there's also a, a sequence coming up of the, the Polish fisher work, the Polish fishermen workers. They're coming off the factory ship just for a break, I think. So it, these sort of films, we don't always we don't always just collect the finished the finished film. We also collect rushes and untransmitted material, perhaps that sometimes has really valuable social history in it, but it just didn't make cut for the final film. And they're feeding the gulls, <laughs> and they're also just having a bit of fun. So you just capture a bit of life through these films, and that's what I love about them. <clears throat>
once more aboard the Isle Fort, which will convey her to the climax of her day, the crowning ceremony, outside the town hall. There are 24 hours in the day, and every one of them is for fishing. In the morning, the same net boats put out for whitefish. Fishing has always been a chancy business, and perhaps nowhere more chancy than on the North Sea banks. A farmer can at least see his crops, but a fisherman may never find it. Machine power saves time and energy. But the man who goes out with the same netters needs the strength and stubbornness and all the nimbleness of foot and hand that generations of seamen have bred into him. It's not a bad living in the fishing for haddock and cod and place and whitey. But they have to go out early and come home late and go dog tired to bed. Hello again. Um, thank you for watching that. I hope you really enjoyed it. I certainly did. Um, I do apologise for the error in the spelling of Port Seaton. I'm sure someone will point that out. Um, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I think inevitably with an online present, oh, an online presentation such as this, copyright restrictions mean it's not possible to choose some material for viewing. But if you do visit our online catalogue, which is at movingimage.nls.uk, or indeed the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow, you'll be able to explore much, much more. The Moving Image catalogue can be accessed um, any time of the day as well. Um, there's over, there's under, just under 4,500 films to view on site at the moment, and over 2,800 of them can be viewed wherever you are in the world. So we have tried very hard to make this collection accessible to everybody and to particularly for the people of Scotland to enjoy, but also people across the world that are interested in Scotland itself. The Moving Image Catalogue has, I had a quick look before this presentation, and at the moment, if you type in fishing into the search box, you'll get 1,356 films. So that should keep you going for a while. Um, there's about 317 coming up with the subject as fish and fishing, which may be a bit more specific, and 164 of them are ready to view. But what I'm trying to get across here is that it's not always an easy fix with moving image. You have to search around the terms that are used because obviously people have been describing images on screen over the years and there's different at different times, there's been different um, levels of cataloging employed. So do search for place, for date, for genre. Maybe you want to only watch sound films, for example, or maybe you only want to find films from the 1920s. So there's all the options there down the left hand side in the search and browse option, and you can combine that with a keyword search. Um, there's also help on hand if you do get stuck and you want to find out a little bit more about some of the films we may have further information and in, for example the paper records or indeed across the National Library generally so it's not just the moving image catalogue you can also search if you go into the the main catalogue search you'll pick up moving image records as well as maps, music, electronic journals, electronic books, everything that you can think of so it's a really um, very collection and you could probably get lost for days in it. So I'd encourage you to do that. So finally, I'd like to just introduce you a little bit more to the Kelvin Hall itself, if you're not sure about what, what we have there. 
Um, we have a facility in the National Library based at Kelvin Hall in Glasgow, and we're open at the moment Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, uh, 10 to 4, and you can come, you can just walk right in at the moment. Obviously, there's coronavirus restrictions in place, but um, I would encourage you to do that if you feel comfortable. But likewise, you can go online from your house as well. And at that site, you'll get everything that you can get at Georgia Fourth Bridge. So everything that's under the legal deposit regulations, you'll be able to access all sorts of journals and books and um, digital material generally. So it's a fantastic facility. We even have a big video wall and areas where skills can come in. And, and so there's a lot to explore. Um, there's also paper records, so I would highlight that it's not just moving image, we have scripts, we have photographs, we have financial records, we have a lot of very detailed um, information about the collection and that's open for viewing as well, although I don't think you can access the paper right at this moment, um, but you'll be able to do that soon I'm sure. And that's the, the web address for Kelvin Hall at the bottom there, so please feel free to go online and have a look around. So I guess all that remains for me to say is thank you so much for tuning in today. It's just been a snapshot, but I hope you've enjoyed it. And the presentation will be, is being recorded and will be put up on YouTube for everyone to enjoy. So if you do want to revisit, please do. Um, I'd also encourage you to keep your eye on our social media channels. The addresses are up there and also the National Library main uh, website. Just keep your eye on things because we're constantly adding to the collection and even in lockdown and all that, we've still kept pushing material out and that's just what's great about this job. So I hope I've given you a taste of the collection and the fishing collections that we have. And I'd like to just open the floor to you guys now. And if you have any questions, please feel free. <laughs>